Thanks, Tina. Next, we got uh, Jason Martinez from Pacific Northwest National Labs. Um, all of you are pr pretty much aware of the uh, different type of tagging and tracking we've done at um, uh, Little Goose Dam uh, for adult fish throughout the years, mostly radial tracking um, for spill patterns, you know, what we've done at Erdek as well. This is the first time we've actually got to use um, the acoustic tags JSAT set up in the tail race and get a kind of a system-wide look at it. And so uh, and we, we thought that, you know, we need to take a look at it through this uh, spoke cap operation, even though the, op the operation may be, you know, not that much different from a high, normal high spill year or whatever. But um, so the JSAT stuff got, um, we finally got to do the JSATs and kind of proof that concept as well as get vital information. Again, we we up the. I uh, want to thank uh, the Lower Granite crew for letting us borrow uh, Steve Lee to uh, beef up the uh, to do some maintenance on the the uh, trap at Ice Harbor, the old uh, Ted Bjorn style trap at Ice Harbor that we rebuilt. This is the second time we used it. As far as I know, it worked real well. And then. Um, we also had a hydraulic test of the temperature pumps at the ladder at Little Goose as well, just a hydraulic test. And so we got a couple slides on that only, so we just added it to the end of this presentation. So welcome, Jason. Good morning, everybody. So before I get started, I'll just go over the um, outline of my study, or the talk. So I'll start out by discussing the study objectives, and then I'll briefly discuss the fish collection and tagging that we did. I'll then describe the detection arrays that we deployed for this study. Um, and then after that, since this was the first time we did acoustic telemetry in a tail race, I'll discuss the control testing we did to understand the 3D tracking performance. And then I will discuss the preliminary results and wrap things up with the conclusions. So the objectives of this study were to evaluate the tail race movements, passage, and fallback of adult Chinook salmon in the Little Goose um, Dam tail race in relation to the increased spill levels due to the gas cap. And some of the metrics of the consequences of the spill that we're looking at are the tail race behavior and movement of fish, the behavior in relation to operations and hydraulic conditions, the any delay in holding in different tail race locations, and preferred entrances into the adult fish ladder. We compare the results that we obtained from this study with previous radio telemetry studies that were conducted in 2013 and 2008. And then, as Chris mentioned, a, a portion of this study involved using the data that we collected in order to um, perform a post-construction evaluation of the new adult fish ladder uh, passage temperature reduction system. So moving on to the fish collection and tagging, we collected all of the fish at Ice Harbor Dam using the trap shown in the slide. Um, once the fish were trapped, they were brought to the surface, anesthetized, and then tagged. And once the fish recovered, they were released the same day, about five miles upstream of Ice Harbor at Levy Park. So in total, we tagged 400 fish with both acoustic tags and pit tags. And the tagging occurred between April 26th and June 6th. Um, and um, this 400 fish represents about 1.3% of the run. So in the graph on the right, we can see the number of fish we tagged each day, represented by the blue bars, as well as the daily counts shown by the yellow line. So we can see we tagged the majority, or our peak tagging occurred around May 16th. And then if we look at the size distribution, as well as the proportion of fish that were clipped versus unclipped, we, we can see our peak size ranged from um, 700 to 750 millimeters. And about 25% of the fish we tagged were unclipped. So the tag we use for this study is what we call the sturgeon tag. This is just the tag that we initially developed for sturgeon because we wanted a tag that could send out a much stronger signal as well as last to up to uh, a year. So this tag has an adjustable source level or signal strength. So for this study, because we knew we'd be working in a tail race where noise levels are higher, we set this tag to output the strongest signal it could at about 163 dB. And we also set the tag the output signal at a relatively high rate of two, um, two seconds between transmissions. So with these settings, 
Um, with this tag, we were able to get about 30 days of tag life, and this was suitable for our study. So now moving on, I'll just discuss the uh, different detection arrays that we deployed. So this map shows the little goose tail race. So um, we just, let's see, we installed modified autonomous receivers within the fish ladder entrances. So here we have two, oops. Here we have two uh, autonomous receivers that were deployed within the North Shore entrance. We also have one at the North Powerhouse entrance. Um, which is between the spillway and the powerhouse, as well as one over on the South Shore entrance. And we also had one near the um, fish viewing area by the pit detector. In addition, we had six autonomous receivers deployed in the North Shore. Um, these were deployed to detect and track fish as they approached the North Shore entrance. And these autonomous receivers had extended battery life, so we were able to deploy these for the entire season without needing to service them because we wouldn't be able to do that with spill going on. We also deployed cabled receivers um, near the outfall pipe of the juvenile bypass system along the south wall and also along the powerhouse terrorist deck as well as the a system in the four bay which was also used for the system survival that Ryan Harnish discussed yesterday. In addition to the system that we deployed at Little Goose Dam, we also used all of the autonomous arrays that we had for the lower granite survival study, as well as the system survival study. And then we also used the pit detectors at each of the dams, as well as pit detectors on the tributaries, which aren't shown in this map. So moving on, as I mentioned, this was the first time we've done um, acoustic telemetry in a tail race. So we wanted to do some control testing to look at the performance of the 3D tracking. So in order to do that, we deploy transmitters from a boat and then um, placed a high accuracy GPS directly above those transmitters. We then drove the boat to each of these um, locations and held it relatively stationary for about two minutes. And although this Google Earth image shows spill, this was done when there was no spill occurring so that we could get the boat in there. Once we collected all of the data, we processed it with our existing 3D solver. And we found that um, the results that we got were acceptable. However, as I mentioned, this was before spill began. Uh, once spill started, um, we noticed we had lower detection efficiency, which would also lower our ability to 3D track. So in order to overcome this challenge, we developed a new solver. So our existing solver is a 3D solver that requires at least four um, receivers to detect the same signal in order to track it. With our new solver, it only computes a 2D location, so just an XY location. Um, but this only requires three hydrophones, so we were able to track many more points using this solver. And you can see in the plot, the blue dots, which might be kind of hard to see, represent the GPS location. The green dots are the new solver, and the purple dots are the older 3D solver. So you can see, for the most part, the old solver and the new solver completely overlap each other. Um, in some locations, the new solver has a little bit higher error, but overall wasn't too bad. So when we look at the actual performance difference, using just a chunk of the data for the um, tagged fish. We can see that with this new solver, we were able to solve more than, or uh, able to track more than 50% or 50% more fish, as well as over 350% more tracked points. And these two plots just show a comparison between the two solvers. So on the left, we have our older 3D solver. And as you can see in this noisy terrace environment where we had less detection efficiency, we basically had less detections where there was at least four receivers detecting that signal. But you can see with our new solver, we were able to actually track many more points to where you can actually understand what was going on. So now moving on, I'll just discuss some of the preliminary results. So this table just shows the detection and tracking summary in different regions. Just a few things I'll point out really quick. Overall, when we combined all of our um, detection arrays in the tail race, we detected about 369 of the 400 fish that we released at Ice Harbor. And the median number of detections that we had on those fish was a little over 7,000. And of those 369 fish, we detected, or I'm sorry, we 3D tracked 345 of those fish with a median number of 128 points tracked. And then if we just compare the results that we got on the um, cable systems on the oops, on the South Shore to the, those six um, autonomous receivers on the North Shore. We detected 19 more fish on the North Shore 
and we had over 50 times more detections on those receivers on the North Shore. So if we look at where fish were first detected as they approached the Little Goose Tail Race, we can see that the largest percentage of fish at about 62% was detect, um, first detected on those six autonomous receivers in that North Shore right below the earthen section of the dam, followed by the South Wall. So if we uh, then look at the where fish first entered the adult ladder, we can see um, in this study in 2018, oops, So um, the most used location was the North Shore entrance at about a little over half. The second used, most used was the South Shore at a little under a half. And hardly any fish used the North Powerhouse entrance, which was that entrance right between the spillway and the powerhouse. So if we compare this to the previous years, we can see that the, the North Powerhouse entrance was always the least used. However, the percentages were still higher in those studies at about 9 and 16%. And this plot just shows um, some of the behavior of, um, of where fish started and if they moved between different regions. So the bar on the left shows the fish that started out on the North Shore, and the bar on the right shows the fish that started on the South. These two blue and cyan boxes represent fish that basically started on that North Shore and stayed the entire time on that North Shore before passing. And the other bars represent fish that started out on one of those sides and then move to different regions before eventually passing. So in my next couple of slides, I have a couple of videos. So I'll play these twice so that I can talk over it the first time and then just simply play it the second time. So this video um, shows some 3D tracks for a specific fish with overlay on the time-lapse camera video. And it might be kind of hard to see from this video um, because of the spray, but if you can kind of see occasionally when it clears up, You'll see there's a large there's a large eddy forms right here between the outfall pipe and the navlock discharge structure. So we can see this fish tends to kind of hang out right on that upstream edge of that um, eddy. And another thing you can see, I have the spill percentage listed here. Um, it's you can kind of see in the video at 30% spill, the eddy kind of just goes just to the navlock discharge structure. And then like in this frame at 40% spill, you can see that eddy gets larger. So now I'll just simply play this again. And one thing to note, this all occurs in a time period of about four hours. So there is some jumps when the fish wasn't being tracked. So just so I can make the video shorter. So in this next video, this shows the um, 3D tracks that we solved from the autonomous receivers that were deployed in that north shore below the earthen section. And those are represented by these little yellow squares. One thing to note, this um, receiver did not have good data, so that's why it's not shown in this video. So in this video, basically what, we, what I did is I took all the 3D tracks that we solved for, took the very first starting time, and just aligned those all so that these fish weren't all there at the same time. I'm just displaying them that way. And this video represents about 30 minutes of data from that first detection. And if you notice, sometimes you might see dots disappear. That just means they weren't tracked for at least a period of one minute. And then once they were tracked again, those dots will reappear. So now I'll just play this again. Another thing to note, this is just a Google Earth image, so this doesn't represent the true tail rights conditions at the time, since this spanned the entire study. And then just to remind, the, the North Shore entrance is here. So now we can look at the fish passage detections at Little Goose. So we can see in this most recent study, we, of the fish we released, we detected 369 of those in the tail race at Little Goose. So about 92%. When we compare this to the previous radio telemetry studies, we can see um, the percentage of fish that were able to reach Little Goose Dam tail race was slightly higher. Um, the previous 2008 study was about 81%, and the 2013 study was about 87 And then when we look at fish that were detected at tail, the, in the tail race that would then eventually pass Little Goose, we can see we had a slightly higher percentage of fish this year that were able to pass the dam.
Then we can look at the median fish passage time. So we can look at the time from when the fish was first detected in the tail race to when it first entered the adult ladder. So in 2008, this, this most recent study, it took fish about 13 hours to do this. This is higher than the previous studies. In 2013, fish only spent about seven and a half hours finding that entrance. And then in 2008, there was, we have three values listed here. That's because they had three different treatments where each treatment was defined as a different spill pattern. So we can see there's quite a range there, but um, it basically goes from five and a half to about 12. So much faster to just only slightly slower or only slightly faster. And if we compare the amount of time that fish um, spent once they found the fish ladder entrance to when they reached the top of the ladder, in 2008, it was about 3.2 hours. And then again, in 2008, um, there were several treatments, but overall, they, these, two, these values kind of are comparable. So then if we look at fallback at Little Goose, of the 367 fish that passed Little Goose, we found that 36 of them experienced fallback, so about 10%. And of those fish um, that fell back, there was a total of 44 events. So that means some fish fell back through the dam twice. So if we look at where they fell through the dam, um, we can see about most of the fallback occurred through the spillway at about 86%. And that's, a, that's 38 events. And if we break that down between the surface spill and the deep spill, um, 25 of those 38 events were through the surface weir and 13 were through the tr uh, traditional spill. So comparing this with the previous studies, um, we can see in this study we had about 10% fallback. Um, in 2013, it was about 7 and a half. And in 2008, it was about 4%. So this graphic, this might also be hard to see. Um, this just shows an example of a fish that experienced fallback. So this fish was detected on the downstream array, uh, autonomous array that was deployed for the system survival. So that's about one and a half kilometers downstream. It first moved up, it was detected in the outfall region, then kind of moved back and forth a few times between the south wall region. It eventually moved up into the powerhouse region. And then, um, although the line shows it cutting across, um, it entered the, the adult ladder on the south shore and then kind of swam around and entered again on the north shore. And then this line shows it cutting right across the spill, but it's really going through the ladder up around, getting detected at the north powerhouse entrance, and then basically ascending the ladder, coming out into the forebay. And then you can see, it's kind of hard, but the red line shows the, um, the track of the fish as it first came out of the fish ladder. So we can see this fish ended up falling back through the dam through spill bay eight. And then it ended up in this north shore region where there's a large eddy. And if you were here yesterday for Ryan Harnish's talk, he mentioned for the juveniles, um, for the fish that, the juveniles that passed through spill bay seven and eight, so those northmost spill bays, um, a large percentage of the fish ended up in that eddy being detected by the receivers we deployed here. So now we can look at the final fate of where our fish were last detected. So overall, about 90% of the fish that we released were able to um, past Lower Granite Dam, which is the next dam above Little Goose on the Snake River. And about 3.5% of the fish that we released, or, or that we captured at Ice Harbor and released just above Ice Harbor, eventually headed downstream and were detected downstream of Ice Harbor. So we're currently planning to do genetic testing on these fish to better understand why fish might have headed downstream. So this just shows the hourly distribution of when adult fish entered the ladder. So we found that about 95% of the fish entered the ladder between 4 a.m. and 7 p.m. And this agrees with the findings from the 2008 study that found that fish were most active during the day and less active at night. So now I'll discuss the proportion of fish that were present in the terrace and that entered the fish ladder under different spill conditions. So this plot shows the spill percentage over a period from May 21st to June 3rd. So as I mentioned, um, we found that fish were most active during the day, so I only considered the daytime periods. And then, um, oops, it's really hard to see the dotted lines, but it's split up by different spill um, percentages. So there's a line here. So in these plots, these orange bars show the number of fish that were present in the tail race at that time. The gray bars are the fish that entered the fish ladder during that time. And this blue line shows the spill percentage. 
So between uh, May 21st and May 24th, spill was typically between 35 and 40 percent. And we found that about 30 to 50 percent of the fish that were present in the towers at that time entered the, the fish ladder under these conditions. For this next period from May 25th to May 29th, spill was higher, uh, about 45 and above. And we found that many less fish entered the fish ladder at only about 20 percent. And then finally, in this last period, um, special 30 percent spill treatments were applied during um, time periods in the morning um, in order to try and help the adults pass Little Goose Dam. So we can see um, when these treatments were applied, so these little peaks down here, um, we can see that um, when spill was at 30 percent, fish were much able, had a much easier time finding the ladder. Um, at about 40 to 65 percent of the fish that were present in the tail race entering the ladder during those 30 percent treatments, which was much higher than the um, previous um, higher spill. So then looking at the same time period, we can look at when, uh, or the proportion of fish that entered the north versus the south shore entrance, since about half the fish used those, each of those entrances. So from this time period between May 21st to May 29th, there wasn't any clear trend in fish choosing one entrance over the other. And in this plot, these, uh, again, the orange bars represent the total number of fish in the tail race. The gray is the fish that entered the north fish ladder entrance and the yellow is the one that entered the south fish ladder entrance. So again, in this time period, we didn't see any clear trends. However, in this time period that included that special 30% spill, um, we can see that when the spill was at 30%, um, there was a much larger percentage of fish that entered the north fish ladder entrance compared to the south fish ladder entrance. So looking at fish movement in the tail race relative to the spill operations, this plot shows the fish that started out on the north or the south shore with respect to the different spill percentage. So as I mentioned earlier, um, a larger percentage of the fish were first detected on that north shore. So these are the blue dots and the orange are the fish that were first detected on the south shore. But as we can see, um, fish, more fish start out on the north shore at um, lower spill percentages. And then as that spill percentage increases, more fish um, end up being on the north shore. And this plot just shows fish that all, only fish that started out on the North Shore and what they did under different spill conditions. So these blue dots represent fish that started on the North and uh, ended also on the North. And then the orange dots are fish that started on the North and then moved to either the South Shore or downstream. So we can see at lower spill percentages, about half the fish on the North Shore would stay on the North Shore and the other half would move to different regions. But as the spill percentage increases, more fish ended up being on that north, moving to that, or staying on the north shore. And then this plot shows the percentage of fish that entered the fish ladder under different spill conditions. So we can see at the lower spill conditions, so as at the 30, we can see a much higher percentage of fish entered the fish ladder. And as the spill um, percentage increases, the percentage of fish present in the tail race that entered the ladder decreased. And then as I mentioned in the objectives, a part of this study involved using the data we collected to do a post-construction evaluation of the adult ladder temperature reduction system. So this plot shows the time from the first pit detection in the adult ladder to when fish actually exit the ladder into the forebay. So we can see when the pump that um, for the adult passage um, ladder temperature reduction system was either on or off, we didn't really see any difference in travel time for those fish. So just to wrap things up with the conclusions, um, this was the first time we did acoustic telemetry in a tail race, and we found that the um, receivers we deployed in the Little Goose tail race um, had a high detection efficiency and good tracking results. We found that more fish experienced fallback under these higher flow conditions this year compared to the previous studies, so about 10% this year compared to about 4% um, and 7.5% in the previous studies. We found that the majority of the fish were first detected on the, the North Shore. We also found that slightly over half the fish utilized the North Shore fish ladder entrance, and just under half the fish used the South Shore or the South Powerhouse entrance. Um, and only a very few fish, three fish total, um, used the North Powerhouse entrance. And when we compare that to the previous studies, we saw that the North Powerhouse entrance, that entrance between the spillway and the um, powerhouse, was always the least used, 
but in the previous studies it was higher um, it was more more commonly used than this year at about 9 and 16 percent compared to 1 percent this year we also found that with the high proportions of spill this year fish took longer times from when they first stepped into the tail race to when they were able to enter the ladder and in this study uh, we found a larger percentage of fish reached the LGS tail race um, from the release location ice harbor compared to the previous studies and of those that reached the tail race a slightly larger percentage uh, were able to pass then when we looked at behavior relative to the different spill uh, operations we saw that when they conducted the special 30 percent spill to help assist the adults we saw that the largest majority of fish that were present in the tail race find the ladder and enter under those 30 percent conditions at about 40 to 65 percent when we looked at time periods when spill was between 35 to 40 percent we see that about 30 to 50 percent of the fish were able to enter the ladder and then under the higher conditions that are about 45 and above um, less than 20 percent of the fish were able to uh, enter the ladder and then um, as i mentioned in the previous slide we looked at the travel time difference between when the fish was pit tagged or pit detected in the adult ladder to when it exited the forebay into the forebay when the pump for the uh, the temperature control system was on or off and we didn't really see any time difference for that for this to wrap things up i'd like to acknowledge that this was funded by the u.s army corps of engineers walla walla district and i'd like to thank the following people from the u.s army corps as well as pacific northwest national laboratory and i'd also like to thank the u.s department of energy for funding some of the related technology development so with that if there are any questions i can take those now i think we have time for one question Yeah, thank you for a good presentation. Uh, quick question. Will you be looking at travel time from release at Goose to the first detection at, I mean, uh, from uh, release at Ice Harbor to the first detection at Lomo in your final report? Yeah, I think, did we have, oh no, we don't, we didn't, yeah, we, we have that information and that will be in the final report. All right, thank you.